रामाय राम भद्राय रामचंद्राय वेद से रघुनाथाय नाथाय सीताय पत ये नम आयोध्य कांड चैप्टर नंबर ट्वेंटी वन द कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ मदर कौशल्यास लैमेंट द रेसिटेशन बिगिन्स नाउ then lakshmana turned to kaushalya who was lamenting her miserable fate and spoke to her as became the occasion mother it seems to me extremely unjust and improper that rama should renounce the crown that is his by lawful right and go to the forest and all that at the bidding of a woman he may say it is not kaikeyi's order that sends me into exile but his majesty's well his majesty is tottering under the weight of years and hence is behest with fancies unsuited to his age the pleasures of the senses enslave him quite he may say a pure heart can set at naught the senses and all their wiles but his reason is completely unhinged by lust and passion besides there is that evil hearted woman kaiki ever at his elbow bounding him on to fresh inequities invested with boundless power and wealth what would not the monarch do to win a smile of that siren if you object that rama might have deserved the punishment by any fault or crime of his i joyfully challenge anyone in all the world to charge rama with treason or treachery or of any heinous sin i see none not even his worst enemy not even the most abandoned wretch that has ever justly punished by him who would ever raise his voice in complaint against rama even behind his back then what chance for any to accuse him to his face i have made up my mind to rid this earth of the unworthy ruler of ayodhya i care not if he is my father or my king or hoary with age an ideal father truly he does well to banish rama to the dreadful forests for it is a plain fact that needs no support of inference that rama excels the very gods in purity at heart his thoughts his words and actions are ever set unswervingly on the path of righteousness the happiness of his people is ever the goal of his ambition good men and great have had the training of him and he has stone control of his senses and their ever fleeting ruler the mind he has endeared himself even to kaiki and his other enemies he is the embodiment of duty and justice nay his lawful right to the throne as the eldest son needs no other ally and would any right minded person banish him from the kingdom for no reason whatsoever on the eve of his coronation towards which he had plighted his faith i care not for his gray hairs for the 60000 years that have passed over his head they disgrace him all the more a slave to lust and passion abandoned to all sense of shame and decency this hoary libertine is a bolt upon good society and i am rendering a very great service to the cause of morality and justice if i send him out of the world which he befouls with his presence let it be stranger still it is to see our prince deeply versed in the traditions of royalty render absolute obedience to the word of a man in his second childhood a very dilapidated old man brother make yourself master of this kingdom before others come to know of this with me at your back i defy anyone in all the world to approach you it were easier task to put to flight the dread god of death in the lawful discharge of his duty let the millions here in ayodhya come against us old or young brahmana or kshatriya it's a child's play for me to reduce this fair city to a howling wilderness in the twinkling of an eye it matters not if bharata stands before us with his friends and allies and his well wishers to support him my keen arrows shall send them straight to the realms of death the gentle and the meek are ever insulted and trampled upon merit is never recognized unless it strongly asserts itself i see no injustice no sin in taking the life of that wicked man our unnatural father who at the instigation of kaiki allies himself with our foes and works evil to us or i would temper justice with mercy and immure him in the depths of a dungeon where he may drag on his miserable days and repent if he can 
The Vedas laid down that our teacher or our father deserves summary chastisement at our hands if he is intoxicated with boundless pride and is lost to the sense of right and wrong. How dared he promise this kingdom to Kaiki when it is yours by every right, human and divine, when he knows that he has no right to alienate it? Did he count upon his valor and that of his armies to chase you from here? Or is it result of Hufuhu's word to Kaike at any cost? Let him know that it is utterly and absolutely impossible now and forever. What mighty hero is he to hope to defeat Rama and his devoted servant Lakshmana and place Bharata on the throne of the Koshalas? Mother, Rama is my brother. He is the object of my reverence and sincere love. And here I solemnly swear on the truth that I hold dear, on the bow that I wield, on the gifts that I have bestowed in charity, on the worship I have offered to the bright gods, that it matters not whether Rama betakes himself to the dark woods or leaps into the heart of the raging fire, but you will find me there before him. Mother, it shall be my care to place my valor and prowess at your service and put away grief and anxiety from you. This day my brother and yourself will behold the might of my arm. Kaushalya heard him out of renewed hope and joy and said with a troubled heart and a faltering voice, Rama, my darling, heard you the words that fell from the lips of your dear brother Lakshmana? They need no comment, and I leave it to your good sense to act as seems best. You may say, Father's words are a law to his son. But is this your father's command? Nay, it is but the insidious instigation of Kaiki, my rival and the evil genius of our king. Besides, it is all opposed to reason, to right, and to justice. Is it kind of you, is it dutiful, to abandon me to my enemies, helpless and alone and stricken with grief and misfortune? Law and duty have no mysteries for you. You have set your heart upon fulfilling the dharma of carrying out your father's commands. But know you not that there is a higher dharma than that? The book teaches us that the mother is the highest and most reverent object that a man can have in this world. So stay with me and devote yourself to my service. I can assure you that there is no higher dharma, none more imperative. Kashipa of yore stayed with his mother and rendered her faithful service and loving with restrained self. His noble tapasya was rewarded with high regions of light and he took his place among the patriarch of the Prajapatis. As your father is to you, so am I. He is worthy of your love and reverence, and so am I. His word is law unto you, and so is mine. Now, I like not your banishing yourself to the forest of Dandaka. You can never have my consent to it. What joy have I in life apart from you? Life itself is a curse to me unless I spend it by your side. I count it a privilege and pleasure to be with you, though I feed upon grass. If you ever leave my side when I am assailed by misfortune and calamity, I will starve myself to death. The ruler of the waters once had the misfortune to grieve the heart of his mother and expiated that lapse of filial duty by bitter experience of the hills that are reserved for the slayers of brahmanas, and the eternal misery shall be your lot here on earth. The heart-rending laments of his mother had no power to seduce Rama away from the path of duty, and he replied gently, On me lies the duties of obeying the commands of my sire. My fealty to you weighs with me no less, but it is impossible for me to do it simultaneously. Besides, my father's orders have the advantage of priority and demand my immediate attention. I dare not set them aside. So I go to the forest and pray you with my head at your feet. Give me your leave and your blessings. Do I seem to pierce your wounded heart? Maharishi Kandu of yore slew a sacred cow at the commands of his father. And was he unacquainted with the intricacies of dharma? Was he not an ascetic of stern vows? I take another instance nearer and more pertinent. 
King Sagara of our line once laid his orders on his 60,000 sons to tear up this broad and fair earth. They obeyed his behest to the very letter and recked not that they were consumed to ashes in the execution of their duty. My father demands of me no such sacrifice of my life, though it is his to dispose of as he wills. He but requires me to spend a trifling period of 14 years in the forest of Dandaka. And shall I all cravenly cry upon it as a great hardship? Jamadagni ordered his son to lop off the head of his mother, Renuka, that bore him. And did Parashurama a waver or flinch? Shall I prove a traitorous and unworthy son to my sire, lest I should cause grief to you for a while? Have you not instances of many a godlike son who carried out his father's behest at any cost? Is it sinful of me to try to walk in their path? Am I the solitary pilgrim on it? Have I not their example, their countenance and their sanction to cheer me on? It is no new hobby of my invention. It is the law of man and it is no rare merit in me if I fulfill it. I will sacrifice anything to spare you the slightest pang, but since I cannot, consistent with the discharge of my duty, I console myself with the hope that no one has come to grief till now who happened to cause some grief to his mother in carrying out his father's commands. Unrivaled in persuasive eloquence as in valor, he next addressed himself to Lakshmana and said, Brother mine, you do me but scant justice to think I know not your boundless love and devotion to me, your prowess, your fortitude, and your all-consuming energy. My mother grieves sorely, all forgetful of the inner mysteries of truth and peace. Surely it ill becomes you to speak thus, and you deeply versed in the secrets of Dharma. Truth is deeply implanted in Dharma, hence it is the most coveted of the Purusharthas, or the aims of life. I secure it best by obeying my father's behests in preference to those of my mother. No one can set out to walk on the way of right and fail to fulfill his promise to his father or to his mother or to the saintly brahmanas. Kaikeyi but passed me on the order of my father that I should dwell in the forests, and who am I to say nay? So put away far from you the cruel instincts of a fanatic Kshatriya that puts you up to say, let us slay this old man, our father, and rule over this kingdom. You are no blind atheist to take kingly polity as the guide of your life, even when it leads away from the path of dharma. Nor are you a fool enough to follow dharma when it leads you away from the path of compassion and love. You never knew me to lead you astray. So spoke he out of deep love for his brother, and then he bowed to Kaushalya over joint palms of respect and said, Mother, is it not immemorial dharma that you, I, Sita, Lakshmana, and Sumitra abide by the commands of my father? His orders demand my immediate attention, and I will dwell for twice seven years in the pleasant woods. Next come your behests, and I will thereafter wait upon you, ever rendering true service and joyful. A brief spell of hardship and rough life for me, and my word to my father is kept. I fly here on the wings of speed to touch your feet, even as King Yayati, who was banished but for a while from his bright abode in the God world to this dark and dull earth of ours. Hence, I pray you master your grief and give me leave to go. Direct the auspicious rites that would secure us a safe journey and happy and bring me back to your side. I entreat it upon my very life. Order the preparations towards my coronation to proceed no further. Put away your grief and sorrow from the eyes of the world. And let me have your leave to speak to the forest that the dharma might find in me a loyal servant. Rama's eloquent pleading, so consonant with truth and virtue and duty, so respectfully firm, so utterly devoid of any selfish grief or disappointed, proved too much for Kaushalya and she fainted under the shock. Regaining her senses after a while, she looked Rama in the eye and cried, Child, 
Do I not deserve at least as much love and obedience at your hands as you owe your father? Flesh of my flesh you are. I bore you in my womb and watched you grow from infancy to youth. Does it not count anything? You see my unspeakable misery and yet you will leave me here alone and helpless to the tender mercies of my relentless foes. Do you expect me to give my consent to it? What is life to me in this world if you are not by my side? What care I to dwell in the radiant worlds of joy or of the fathers or of the gods? An hour with you is worth eternities in those spheres. Elephant hunters take their stand during dark nights across his path and seek to drive it back towards the treacherous pits by threatening it with blazing torches only to enrage it afresh without turning it from the track it had marked out for itself. Even so, the pitiable laments of his mother but roused him to fresh energy and firmness in that she would not yet desist from dragging his feet from the path of dharma. He saw his beloved mother senseless with grief. He saw his brother Lakshmana writhe under the torments of impotent anger and valor. Yet his heart never wavered, not for a second in his loyal allegiance to Dharma. And his words to Kaushalya were in perfect consonance therewith. Duty, equally imperative and just, but conflicting, hemmed him on every side, and he hesitated not for a moment to choose the best and follow it with unshaken resolve. And the countless worlds cannot furnish another who could take his place by the side of Rama, the beloved of all living beings. Such words fall fitly and gracefully from his lips and from no other. Lakshmana, you force me to remind you that I know and appreciate best your whole-souled devotion to me and your matchless valor. But you force me also to say that you and my dear mother caused me fruitless annoyance and trouble by your willful blindness to my inner motives. Hear me place before you at some length what I hinted to you just now. A wife secures to her husband dharma if she acts in consonance with the laws of his life. She secures to him love if she deserves to find a place in his heart. She secures to him wealth if she is the mother of an exemplary son. Thus one and the same woman helps a man to achieve three aims of life. These are said to be the surest means to attain the happiness that accrues of dharma. Or, in other words, do your duty to the best of your lights and you are the master of the above means. Take my word for it that this is utter truth and beyond the shadow of a doubt. None should waste his time and energy over anything that leads him not straight to the three Purusharthas. Engage yourself in the conscientious performance of that which will secure your dharma as a result. The world hates him who seeks wealth at any cost, nor is it seemly to devote yourself solely to the pursuit of pleasure. So let us decide where my line of duty lies at present. The king is my guru in that I sat at his feet to learn the mysteries of the art of war and the science of polity. He is my monarch under the shadow of whose protecting arm I live in peace and happiness. He is my father who brought me into this world. His great age and ripe experience deserve my utmost respect. If such a one commands me anything, be it out of love or anger or self-interest, would anyone who knows the inner mysteries of dharma that a plighted word should always be followed by the fulfillment thereof go back upon his promise unless a cruel heart goes before crueler deeds? I have no talents that way I seek to carry out to my best the promise made by my sire. He is our Lord and of my mother too. He is the highest goal of her aspirations. He is the surest guide to lead her to the worlds of the blessed. He is ruling over this vast realm for many thousands of years more justly, more righteously than his glorious predecessors. Is it seemly, is it decent for my mother to come away with me as if she were an ordinary woman? Helpless, friendless, as if she were a wife widowed of her lord and protector? 
Mother, I go to the forest. Pray give me leave. Engage yourself in such auspicious rites as will ensure us a safe return to your side. King Gayati was banished from heaven but was restored to it through his unshaken allegiance to truth. Even so shall I come back to you safe and happy at the end of fourteen years. It is not in me to sacrifice unparalleled fame to kingly rule and power, one of righteousness. Our life here on the earth is but a lightning flash in the dark cloud of eternity, and far be it from me the desire to be the lord of the earth and stain my hands with this crime. So the ruler of men consoled his weeping mother and resolved to start at once to the forest of Dandaka in obedience to the words of Kaike. He explained to Lakshmana the motives that lay behind the course of action adopted by him and prepared himself to go round his mother in reverent salutation and have her leave to depart. Mangalam Koshnendraya Mahaniya Gunabdeya Chakravarti Dhanurjaya Sarvabhomaya Mangalam